Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Today's verse is very much connected with the previous one. So if you haven't watched it, go back and check it out. And then we can talk about this one, and it'll have more context and make more sense. Besides that, saying either, I do not know myself, or I have known myself, is a wide ground for ridicule. Why? To make oneself an object known. Are there two selves, one of which can be known by the other? Because being one is the truth of everyone's experience. That is, whether they be a jnani or an ajnani, everyone experiences the truth. I am one. One without a second. Huh? God made each one of us and threw away the mold. <laughs> but you know, it's true. People don't think things through. They take a superficial hit on it and just blurt it out and don't realize what they're really saying. So to say, I have seen the self is as ridiculous as saying, I have not seen the self. Huh? Who are you? <laughs> Who is the seer? The self. So unless you have some kind of mirror that can reflect a transcendental being, you can't see. You can't see. At the most, you can infer the existence of the self by its illumination of other things. Indirectly. For example, in the high states of meditation called jhanas. One can see a light, uh, sometimes a very brilliant light. But what is this light? Uh, it's actually the self reflected in the purified mind. So you have not seen the self directly. You have only seen its illumination when it's reflected from the mind. And the mind has to be in a certain state, too. Otherwise, you can't see. Just like if you take an ordinary mirror and use it to reflect the moon, you won't see very much, huh? Just a kind of a bright spot. But if you carefully grind it into a certain shape, and put it in a telescope, then you can see all kinds of details. So similarly, the ordinary mind in the ordinary state is opaque. It cannot reflect the light of the self. Even though the self is always there, the self is always brilliant and illuminating everything that we perceive. But the mind in its ordinary state blocks that out. And you'll see in meditation, uh, if you get to the state where you're seeing the light and then you have a heavy thought, it's like a cloud goes across the sun. But the mind, when polished and formed in a certain way, can reflect a remarkably a detailed image of the self, but it's still, you're not seeing the self directly. You're only seeing the mind. So ultimately, this uh, attempt to see one's self has to be given up. And one has to simply be the self. Because really, there's nothing that can reveal, nothing that can reflect or image the self. And certainly there is no second self by which we can see ourselves. 
If we think there is, that means we're identifying with the mind and ego. So that's why <laughs> Bhagavan says it's a wide ground for ridicule. <laughs> and you can read if you uh, look in the conversations book or the talks book, talks with Ramana Maharshi. You can see there are many conversations where he will ask someone, do you exist? <laughs> well, what does that mean? He's saying, are you the self? Are you one? Are you self-aware? Are you aware of your existence? And of course, people say yes. So he goes, ah, so you're already self-realized. <laughs> You just don't recognize it for what it is. Why? You haven't thought it through. You haven't understood the meaning of the fact that you are percipient, that you are conscious, and most of all, that you are self-aware. Conscious of being conscious, aware of awareness. This means you are the self, you are Brahman, because that's the definition of Brahman. Pure objectless awareness, non-dual. Similarly, saying things, well, we'll get into this in the next verse, <laughs> arguing whether the self is dual or non-dual or whether reality is one or two or three or whatever it is is ridiculous because there is only the self. And everything else that we experience is within the self and is a result of, not caused by exactly the self, but a result of the self's existence. Just like a catalyst in a chemical reaction, often there is a substance that has to be present for a particular reaction to take place. And the substance, the catalyst, is not consumed in the reaction, it merely has to be present. So, like a catalytic converter in a car, huh? it gets rid of the carbon in the exhaust by combining it with other things. So, how is it doing that? Huh? simply by its presence, simply by the presence of the self, the whole universe comes into being. This is our experience, if we're honest. Huh? If we don't buy into the whole story of objective reality and all that, uh, that the so-called enlightenment came up with, huh? the so-called scientific point of view of objective reality, no. All reality, including your scientific experiments, is subjective only. The scientist, when he sees or observes the result of his experiment, is the self. And he's observing it within his consciousness, subjectively. So the idea that there is an objective world out there is simply a theory. It cannot be proven. Let that sink in for a minute. The theory that there is an objective universe that exists whether we're there to observe it or not is simply that. It's just a theory. It's just an idea, and it can not be proven. Why? <laughs> because who is going to perceive and recognize the proof? You and me, right? <laughs> and we are the self. So it's ultimately subjective. All reality, all existence, all consciousness and observations and experience is subjective only. It cannot be objective because there's no proof of it. Try to understand. See, this, this whole teaching is going to bust the bubble of Western uh, civilization, which is built on the idea 
that there is some separate objective reality and eternal scientific laws. I love this. <laughs> How do we know this? We can't know it. Anything we know is only subjective. And there is no objective observation. Well, what if we use instruments? You still have to read the instruments. Huh? Or if you use computers, you still have to read the printout or the display or whatever it is. And that's a subjective awareness. You can't get out of this one. <laughs> Just like you can't get out of the idea that there is no second self with which to see the self. So you can only be the self. You can only experience reality. It can't have a separate existence beyond your experience. And somebody will argue, well, if you go to sleep at night and then you wake up in the morning and ask the people who were up all night, was the reality there the whole time? They'll say yes. Huh? So actually there is an objective reality. No, no. If you're in a dream and you ask the people in the dream, is this reality? They'll say yes. And was, was this existing while I was awake? Before I came into my dream? They say, oh, of course, this is reality. <laughs> but then you wake up and you're in a different reality, in a different body, a different place and time. So try to understand. Reality, with a capital R, absolute reality, is only subjective. Every kind of reality that is so-called objective is relative and temporary. Therefore, it's not real at all by the standards of the Upanishads. Because the standard of the Upanishads is that Whatever is real must exist always, without change. So the only thing that meets that criterion is the self. So try to understand. People don't think things through. Just like I sometimes will omit a very important concept from a discussion, just to see if anybody picks up on it, if anybody's thinking things through and will write me and, and point it out. And they almost never do. <laughs> just like the other day we were talking about karma yoga. And karma yoga, of course, this is how you neutralize your karma. Each of us is bound to have certain things happen in our life. This is called prarabdha karma, meaning ripened karma. It's the karma that we created in a previous life, and now this body and all of its activities and so on are going on by this prarabdha karma. And then people are going to say, no, no, it's by my will. I decide what I'm going to do, and then I do it. But if we really observe ourselves, it's not so. But what happens is we'll make plans or we'll have desires which amount to the same thing. And then most of the time it doesn't work out, does it? Be honest. Most of the time our plans and desires don't work out. That's because they're not part of our prarabdha karma. And then the few times when we guess right, <laughs> we want to take credit and say, I did that. But as soon as you do, guess what? That becomes another cause of more karma in the future. So karma yoga is the art of withdrawing the idea of I did it from the things that happen. Because actually that idea is just an illusion anyway. 
So anyway, uh, only one out of so many viewers wrote me about that. And how do you do that? <laughs> and of course, this video is my karma yoga. This is how I engage the things that I love to do and would be doing anyway. But instead of doing them for my own good, I'm doing them for the benefit of others. And that's my karma yoga. Aung Tatsa, Aung Harihi Aung.